everyone. Hi from wherever you might be watching. Welcome to WG Festival 2021. Uh, I hope you're enjoying and getting a lot out of the programming that's been happening today. You are now watching one of my favorite events that we do, Research Methods for Writers. And before we get too far into it, let me introduce myself. My name is Lauren O'Connor, and I'm a librarian and archivist at the Writers Guild Foundation. We have a pretty massive library of film and TV scripts and writers papers that span the history of screenwriting. And this event, Research Methods, was born from our working in the library and recognizing that film and TV writers often have very specific research needs. Um, so while we talk ad nauseum about the writing process, the process of discovering, gathering, utilizing information, and implementing it into a script is often a little more shrouded in mystery. Um, so this conversation about research and the role it plays in developing and writing films and TV series, uh, th that's what this conversation will be about. Um, and I'm very excited because today we'll be having that conversation with Stephen Knight. Um, so just a tiny bit of background for everybody. Um, Steven started out writing novels, and in case you didn't know, he also co-created Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And his first screenplay was 2002's Dirty Pretty Things, for which he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. He's written dozens of other movies since, like Eastern Promises, Burnt, Locke. Um, and for television, he is, of course, the creator of the BBC series Peaky Blinders and the Apple TV Plus series C. Um, he's written novels, plays, pretty much everything. But my goal today um, is to talk mostly about um, research in the context of Stephen's latest film, Spencer, which is an imagining of a very tumultuous Christmas for Princess Diana. Um, so with that said, Stephen, welcome. My, uh, hello, hello, hello. My clapping right now is representative here. of everybody out there who is watching this. Okay. Um, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk to writers. Um, so now that we have heard a little bit of your CV, um, I just <laughs> I just like to ask a couple of introductory questions. Um, so when and how did writing become a thing for you? When you first started, what kinds of things were you writing? Uh, if writing became a thing for me when I was 11 years old. Um, I came from a background where there were, there were no books in the house. It wasn't something that I would naturally have led to, but I, I started to write stuff at school and there was a particular teacher who encouraged me. Um, so I came to believe that it was something I could do well. So I studied English at university and then began working in, first of all, in radio, which I would recommend to everyone who is a writer. Radio is such a great medium for writers because it's just you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so as, as we mentioned, Dirty Pretty Things was your first screenplay. Um, and I was watching this interview with BAFTA where you explained it started out as a novel, then you realized while writing it that it was probably a movie. Um, can you go into some detail about how when you, you know, set about to write that as a screenplay, if you'd never written one before, how you kind of taught yourself? Well, I'd written television before, um, okay. but, but nothing sort of on the scale of that. And this was meant to be my fourth novel of, of a contract with Penguin. But for some reason, well, I know there isn't, it's, I've been in, the, in London, the BBC Broadcasting House is opposite a big hotel called The Langham, which is a very posh, hotel and I'd left a meeting at the BBC and I looked at the hotel and I, for some reason I had to go into the lobby and I just wondered about this place I've always been fascinated by hotels so I just wondered what's going to happen here tonight when everybody's gone and I began to write the story of the person who was sitting behind the desk the night causer but for some reason and I think this is an under sort of considered um, difference between novels and screenplays I started to write the novel in the present tense Mm. I started to write it as it was happening right now, just because I did that. And as soon as you do that, it begins to feel like a screenplay because you're describing something that's happening right now. You're not saying this happened. You're not the sort of disembodied uh, narrator who knows everything. You're somebody who's just watching what's happening. And I'd got probably about 20 pages in and thought this, this feels like a screenplay. So it was, I didn't have final draft then. So I wrote it in 
whatever the, it was on, a, on whatever that system was and no yeah. one could read it because it was just it was just like a blur of words on a page <laughs> so I had to get final draft and then people started to understand and I always love um, asking this of screenwriters, but um, do you happen to remember the first screenplay you ever read? Do you know what? I, I haven't read many. I don't think I've ever read a screenplay on paper or on a screen um, for any reason other than for work. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've never yeah, saw yeah. one. Out. I remember being in New York and there was a, a stall in um, where was it Mercer Street and somebody was selling these screenplays. And I bought a couple of films that I really liked, and then I lost them. They didn't make it all the way to the end. <laughs> but I, I just thought, this is a great idea to read this. And I've often thought, you know, it wouldn't be a bad way to write a novel in Final Draft. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, OK, so this is my last of kind of the introductory questions here, and then we'll really get into it. But um, if I was brand new to writing for film or TV, what would be on your curriculum for me to sort of like read or watch um and maybe like another way of putting that would be who or what has been your best teacher or greatest source of inspiration in your your screenwriting i would i'd say two things first of all it depends what sort of film you want to make and, and what sort of work you want to do and I'm splitting that into as well i would say try and do as many different sorts of things as you can because everything teaches you about everything else i would suggest if you're interested in dialogue, reading transcripts of real conversations rather than, first of all, go into screenplays because real conversations are mad. They're all over the place and people say the strange things. And when you see it written down, it's so weird and it's almost beautiful. And you think, if I saw that, if somebody submitted that as a screenplay, I think this is fantastic. But it's just exactly what people said. But then if you wanted to do the kind of work that I do, which is very uh, dependent on dialogue. Um, I would look at something like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, um, which is just one of my favorite films for the fact that it's just, well, it's, I mean, Burton and Taylor, but it's just dialogue and it's just this mad drunken argument. Right. And it's beautiful and so well written. So, <laughs> so well written. Absolutely. Well, and I was thinking too, since you said you started in radio, um, is there anything in particular that you learned about, you know, writing dialogue from that? Because I notice, like, when I read radio scripts, you know, we have some in the library, um, all the characters just have really, really distinct ways of talking. Um, and I sort of just figured, I'm like, yeah, that's because, you know, like, we're not seeing them, so we have to no, know. No, exactly. Them. Yeah. That is absolutely the, the, the great observation of why radio is good, because it's exactly that. It's because you've got to distinguish between all the characters from how they speak, not because you can see them and how they look. Also, I think, um, I mean, I, I started doing radio commercials as well, and commercials, when they've got to be 30 seconds long, treat, teaches you the value of each word and the, the time it's in there. Mm -hmm. um, but also, um, I, I did comedy on radio as well, and comedy teaches you that if anybody knows this, if you tell a joke to a group of people, and you fluff a line or you get a word wrong or you pause in the wrong place, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of trying to apply, uh, apply the, the, the rigors of joke telling to drama. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's got to be dead right. Otherwise, it's going to go bang. It's just going to fall over. Oh, that's excellent. Radio is brilliant. I, if someone was starting out now, whenever anybody says they're starting out, I would recommend radio because it's just a beautiful medium. Cool. Um, okay, so um, tell me about Spencer and specifically how the project came to you. Um, it was a, it's an odd one, which is always good for me because I always like to do things that I don't normally not things that I'm not expecting myself to do next. Um, and Pablo Lorena, obviously, you take that meeting, you know. Um, and we had breakfast in London, and he said he wanted to do something about. Diana, and that was the brief, something about that. And, and Diana's not um, someone who has preoccupied me for since she's died. However, um, when her funeral happened, I was working in Canada and I was up very early in the morning about to start work and I watched the funeral and I saw the gates open. I saw the funeral cortege appear. 
and it was the most incredible piece of theatre with the boys walking in front and the cannons firing the salutes and the main thing was English people who were lining the streets and I could, I could see when I was watching the coverage they were quintessentially normal average English people they were wailing and sobbing which is not what English people do and it just made me think what's going on why has this happened and then I found myself being really emotional while watching sort of about the connection between the English people and this person and and what's what has happened here you know it's, it felt sort of very historical, a, a, a historical change. So I parked that confusion. And then when Pablo mentioned Diana, I thought, well, that's always something I wanted to explore. So I thought I would do it to do that. Sure. Um, so the movie is not like a huge sprawling biopic that endeavors to include every moment of Diana's life on a timeline, um, but rather it covers, you know, like those four days and Christmas at Sandringham. Um, and my question for you is, even if your movie only covers that small period of time, do you still have to know the whole timeline in order to write it? I, I wrote it hoping that if no one knew this story, they would just see the story of someone in a position and a situation that may be recognisable to all of us, which is a religious festival where the family are, or a celebration festival where the family are obliged to come together and it's not nice and you don't want to be there and there's a lot of tension and a lot of pressure. I mean, that's a sort of a universal thing. Um, but I just wanted to explore that times a million, you know, yeah. and, and how... How, how that how that must have felt for her and tried to the, the I mean the reason for doing three days is because it, it, it speaks a lot about the difference between movies and television I think but if you've got a movie you, you can't really do it you know or I can't really do it I can't tell her whole life elegantly or in any depth what I wanted to do was almost be paparazzi where you just take a snapshot you look through the keyhole and you see this thing and sometimes you see a photograph of someone, especially of her, actually, and you sort of know a lot about her, you know, or you see footage of her, you know, just in that moment, you get it. And what I wanted to do was to take a particularly pressurised, difficult, familiar to everyone situation and see if I could find the human being beneath the icon in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I watched it, it sort of, it reminded me just of a Christmas movie, of like, just like with the royal family. <laughs> yes. okay. That's what it is. Um, yeah. So when you sit down to do research, where does that factor into your writing process? Do you research and write at the same time, or do you have a specific research period? Well, I have a, a very odd relationship uh, with research. Um, in this particular case, it was as odd as, as ever. In other words, I, I hadn't watched, I haven't ever watched The Crown, mm -hmm. not because I, I'm, people whose opinions I completely respect say that it's fantastic and brilliant, and I'm sure it is, but I, ch I choose not to watch a lot of television um, and I hadn't watched any of the films about Diana and didn't then go and watch them because I thought, my, my belief is that the best thing you can do if you're dealing with a true story is rely on first-hand accounts or the truth. It, I, I think that it's the historian's job to look back and find a pattern. And historians, when you read history, you'll always feel that whatever happened was inevitable because you know, the, the historian will find factors that built up and built up and, and integrated. And then, of course, this happened. You know, how could anything else have ever happened? When, in fact... We all know in our daily lives, reality is chaos. And there isn't really a pattern. And so I think you find the chaos or the, the, the more weird pattern by, if you can, of course, it's not always possible, but it was possible in this case, to talk to people who were there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was able to do. So I was able to track down people who served and observed during that period. They were in the house. They were below stairs. They weren't members of the family. They were, you know, staff. And collected stories of actual events, things that happened, 
and use those as stepping stones. And then in between, you can have the fable. You can start to imagine how it feels to be her to go between those stepping stones. Because as ever, in my experience, things that really happened are so weird and so odd. So in the film, anything that seems unbelievable is true. You know, but that's always, I think it's true of almost every situation that if you hear the true story of what happened on that night, it's so mad, you know. And, and that's what I've tried to do is not try and find the pattern, but try and find the, the odd things that happened. And then often you have to sort of tone it down a bit mm-hmm. because it's, people wouldn't believe it, even though it's true. So often that's the case where you have to sort of take something out because you think no one would actually think that's real. They think you've gone mad. Um, so that's exactly what happened in this case. So I spoke to some people uh, who, um, on condition of confidentiality, but they were people who served and worked during that weekend. So how does that work when you when you're in search of sort of firsthand accounts? Um, you sort of track people down and then like take them out to breakfast and or what? It, like it how does that work? It was a bit easier than that. Um, in that um, I, I knew some people who knew people who knew her and some people who knew her very vaguely and quite a few people who had met her and through that network I was able to track down a couple of people who were um, I'm trying not to narrow anything down but who <laughs> were you know quite senior within the below stairs um, setup and just said what was it like you know and what was what was the menu and what time did you eat and 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 from that, from those simple questions, you always get the oddest things. And then what I try to do is make sure that that is the structure of the whole thing. Got it. Um, so does the process change from project to project or do you always kind of go about it in that same way? It's, it's different. If, obviously, if it's a true story where there were eyewitnesses, there were people who were there. They're the first person people I would go to. Obviously, historical stuff there often, well, there, there isn't anyone you can talk to. So then you go to books, which is fine. So you'd read a book. And I would always read a book being aware that the historian's job is to find the pattern, as I say. So there's probably really interesting stuff that's not in there. And I've got a technique, which sounds a bit bonkers, but I do it you well always is if i'm writing recently i was writing something about new york in the 1840s so go on the internet and do new york 1840s ice cream yeah or new york 1840s i don't know red wine or anything cabbages anything and what you'll get because the internet bless it is just this mad mess of stuff that that will take you to the most crazy things you know, the, the most strange things that, um, because what you've done is added a, a, a random element. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the random element will take you to somewhere where then you've got to, you've got to get back. And I, a years ago, when I was about 20, I think, I went and saw a, there's a philosopher called Edward de Bono who did a talk about creativity. I don't know why I went, but I went. And he said, if you're on a journey from home to somewhere you've never been, it gets more and more difficult because you're less and less familiar. He said, but if you're going from somewhere strange to home, it gets easier and easier. So he said, if you're in the creative process, go somewhere strange, go to, again, I'll use cabbage. You know, you're writing the thing about Henry VIII, go to cabbage and start thinking about cabbages and try to get back from cabbage to Henry VIII. And you'll find the journey, first of all, it gets easier, but it's also really interesting. Mm-hmm. Because you've started somewhere that no one is expected. I know it sounds a bit bonkers, but that's. I think that the more you can um, disrupt the pattern when you're doing research, the more you can be random, the more creative it will be and the cleverer you will seem, even though all you did is went <laughs> to a different place. That's so helpful. Um, so um, I'm also kind of curious, this is like a tiny bit tangential, um, but if you're doing a TV series like C that is kind of like futuristic and, and um, scientific, what 
what is that research process like? Do you, are, are you, what are you going for there? Well, that was different again entirely because what we did for that, we had a room and it was a writer's room, but it was also a sort of, um, it was a, a great experience because all these different, there were survivalists. Obviously there were people with uh, no vision or limited vision who were a key part of the research team about, you know, the experience of it. <laughs> um, and futurologists and people who worked on power turbines and what would what would survive and so that was a very specific that was a very research heavy project because what you wanted to do was sort of take the 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 odd concept which you know it's based on a, a very curious concept and then play it out and play it through and see what would what it would be like then but then i think you have to respect the research but also respect what you're writing more so you know again the research is probably the stepping stones but in between you've got to play around with it and, and imagine that that's not actually definitely true you know, it might sure, not be sure. it might be something else mm -hmm. um okay so how um so <laughs> back to spencer um, so how does character development change when you're writing not only a real person, but an extremely well-known iconic person? Again, um, I tried to take as much as I could from first-hand accounts of how she was that weekend. And lots of it obviously fitted in with what we all know, um, you know, about her condition. She wasn't well. Everybody knows she wasn't well. They know the nature of her sort of unwellness. But as all human beings, you know, it's like she was not defined by those conditions, minute by minute. Some minutes she would be, other minutes it was gone, you know, as if it was gone. So it's trying to find that sort of uh, thing that all human beings do where there can be a really sort of uh, preoccupying, desperate, urgent, thing going on in the life but also you can then break off and talk about something else and have a cup of coffee and, and a cigarette and do something else and you know it's that it's that trying to get to, I think Diana is like she rebels sometimes horribly and then she sort of apologizes and goes no 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 it's fine, it's fine. then rebels then apologize and we all do that I think you know we're not we're not one thing ever we're not a missile you know we just bump along and I tried to find that in in her but also I think with her, actually, more than anyone else, newsreel footage was interesting because often you'd see footage and you could see she was trying not to laugh. You know, she'd been in some terribly formal situation and you thought, she's trying not to laugh. There. She's going to laugh anyway. And you just thought, well, I get that. You know, maybe <laughs> okay. I was there. And this was going on. I'd probably try not to. And I think there was something very uh, um, att uh, attainable about her. In other words, you could sort of see what was going on. Um, and I don't, but well, it wasn't an act. You could see what was going on. So therefore that made people, I think, empathetic towards it. And I think people, and what I got from the staff is that she was a warrior going into battle with no weapons, nothing. You know, she didn't really have the guile. She didn't really have, uh, she wasn't motivated by hatred, do you know what I mean? Which would, which would probably have given her a lot more energy. She wasn't like that. She was, didn't hate anybody, you know, she wasn't hating someone. So therefore she was really getting her own way. Yeah. And so I think she was sort of defenseless, but um, it, the fact that she was defenseless gave her an army, if you like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Joan of Arc, you know, she's a 14 year old and, and the whole of France supports her. So I think there's a bit of that film. Sure. Um, can you talk about the Anne Boleyn comparison that Diana starts making in the film and how that came about? Yeah, I mean, I've been interested in Anne Boleyn um, for quite a lot. Well, the, the Henry VIII, the Tudors and all of that, really interested in that. And Anne Boleyn's story is quite fantastic and fascinating. And the difference is that Anne Boleyn, I was just talking about being defenseless. Anne Boleyn was not defenseless. You know, Anne Boleyn had an ambition and a goal to do what she did and she did it and it went horribly wrong. And in the end, she was innocent of all the things she was accused of and was executed. Now, I didn't want to drive that comparison too much because there's so many people who will read things into it. But 
Uh, I just think that what Diana did was choose to enter a situation which it wasn't inevitable. There's no fate involved, but ultimately it resulted in her demise. Mm-hmm. You know, not because anybody wished it, but because that was almost like that was always going to happen. And I think that the, the, the same with Anne Boleyn. It would almost be like if Anne Boleyn were around now, she would say, just get out. You know, because there were times when in Anne Boleyn's story when she could have just escaped, she could have gone to France, but she chose not to. She stayed. And it's like if, if that woman were around now, she would say, just it, it's not worth it, go. Absolutely. Um, So you've mentioned uh, starting many of your projects with the opening scene. Um, Is that how you started here uh, with this film? And and if so, how did that come to you? Um, I I always start by just starting to write. And I think the thing I tell myself is this isn't really me starting. This is me just messing about. I think that if you're a writer, that gives you a nice relaxed feeling you know it's later when there's, you're getting towards a deadline you have to worry but, but you can just go okay I'm just going to do anything anything and with with this I just thought always in your mind is what happened at the end in her life mm-hmm. she was in a car so you you're aware of that you're aware of driving quickly and, and stuff so just the idea that she's driving but the idea that she's lost as well uh, and doesn't know where she is. And I think that gives you then, and I, I wanted her to very quickly encounter normal people and behave completely normally, almost forgetting that as soon as she walks into a room, everybody's like, oh my God, it's her. Because <laughs> that was true. I mean, this is, I was told that was true of her. She would forget. She would forget the effect she would have on people. So I wanted to get that in early. And then when she said, I don't know where I am, um, she didn't really know where she was. So what I wanted was lots of things going at the same time. See the the Suffolk flat English countryside as well um, and get two or three things going on at the same time is always a good way to start. Sure. Um, So uh, something I've noticed about your scripts um, is they're very descriptive. They almost feel like novels in certain places and they're, they're full of experiential details. Um, how do you find those details? Does it does it come from um, you know research and talking to people, or or your imagination, or or both? I, it's, it's probably both. When I'm sitting at the keyboard, something happens that, um, as I say, I, I start writing and it, I, I write, and then I read it back, and sort of don't know what it's about until I've read it back. Anyway, and I I've said this before many times. I I believe that when you're when you're writing a script and you're sort of seeing, you're seeing it, you're looking at the screen, but you're seeing what you're writing about. It's got to be in the same part of the brain as dreaming. It's got to be, because it feels like that, where, um, you know, when you everybody goes to sleep and then characters they know or people they've met in their lives pop up and say things, then the dialogue's brilliant in a dream. It's never, there's no exposition in a dream. There's no sort of clunky dialogue. People talk the way they talk. So somewhere in your brain, I think there is an ability to take experience and reconfigure it in a new form. And I think that the best stuff comes when you're in that sort of state where you, you, you know, I can't have music or words or noise or anything. You just get into it and then you, you just let it go. You know, you know vaguely what the situation is and you put the characters together and then you sort of let them talk to each other sort of thing Mm -hmm. and then it's not a very efficient way of doing it but I just think it gives you some quite odd things which is good it's always good um yes (laughs) um, so that that leads me um to this question where um how do you approach exposition and making certain bits of history or knowledge relevant to the lay audience or reader I mean, it's always, I'm sure that this is a common thing amongst all writers, but if you can get exposition across during the moments of great tension or danger, then great. (laughs) Then you've sort of oiled it and allowed it to go through. Um, uh, I worked with David Fincher, he said, never explain anything. 
which is, is not a bad motto. I mean, it, it, it can get you into trouble because people can get confused. But, um, you know, I always think in, in your life, in everybody's life, you meet people and they don't come in and introduce themselves and tell you what sort of person they are. You know, they just introduce themselves as their name. And pe- human beings are brilliant at picking up what someone is and who they are and how they are from very few clues. And if the actors are good enough, I think they can do that. They can give everything without you having to really bank, you know. And, and audiences now are so sophisticated that if there is a hint of exposition, everybody groans and rolls their eyes, which is <laughs> quite right. right. I often wish we could have captions where you just put a caption on the stage. Right. <laughs> right. This is who this person is. Now just let's so go. You know, this is what this yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like they used to do the silent movies. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Um, and this is just like a, a small question, but uh, I something that I just I really latched onto when I was watching the movie was uh, the sign in the kitchen that said "Keep noise to a minimum; they can hear you." you. Um, how did you How did you find that? Was it's that in true. the script? Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I mean, that was that, that that again. You know, the true things are always fantastic. That that's true. I loved that. Um, so. Um, I know um, you've expressed before that your process could be a little bit easier um, if you outlined or wrote treatments. Yeah. Um, did you do any any kind of um, outlining for Spencer? And before you like set pen to paper, did you know the ending? Yeah, I, well, no, I knew it'd be, it had to be a happy ending because we all know the real ending, the ultimate ending was not happy. And I wanted this to be a fairy tale. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's about a princess and all fairy tales are in their origin horror stories I think um, and they're full of fear and, and you know baddies and monsters and things so I wanted all of that in there but I knew that like a good fairy story had to end with the princess escaping from the you know, the, the enchanted castle uh, so I knew that I knew she'd have to take her children with her and um I knew it would involve food because I knew the whole thing was going to be because in in the in speaking to people who were there, they would say Christmas at Sandringham is a succession of meals, not just three meals a day. It's like 10 meals with tea and breakfast and everything between breakfast and lunch, between lunch. And so it's constant food. And you have to imagine Diana with her condition being confronted with that. So I knew that the ending would be happy and would involve food. So KFC is probably <laughs> the best one. <laughs> it's going to be McDonald's, but they wouldn't give us permission. I mean, so, in, in my world, uh, fairy tales end with KFC too, so. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Handsome tweets, yeah. Colonel oh. Um, So did you look to any other films or books or plays, like specifically for, for inspiration, or was it all kind of subconscious? I, I, it, I mean, I, I, in the old days, I used to refer to other things and say, yeah, that was a big influence, but it wasn't true. Not that I don't need other influences, but I don't find that it works for me to refer something to something else that's also fiction. Um, I much prefer to refer it to, you know, it's a true event, to, to the event, but that's not trying to be clever at all because some of the greatest works of art, pieces of fiction, films have all been references to other works of art. And that's absolutely fantastic. And just for me, I, I, I don't work like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, do you work with um, like a formal historical consultant? Uh, did you on this or on other projects? I have done on other projects where um, you're dealing with a period that, you know, if you don't know a lot about it, sometimes it's easier to have someone. It's, usually they act as gatekeepers, I think, where you write something and then the person who knows actually what they're talking about goes, well, that would never have happened. And it saves you a lot of embarrassment <laughs> and a lot of rushes when, you know, you've made a complete howler and somebody comes along quietly and says, well, actually, you know, so that how that works. Years. That that works like you you present them with like we're like I want to take this in this direction. Does that feel yeah. okay? Yeah, yeah. And then but then sometimes when they if you're talking to um uh, to 
they they will mention something that then takes you off into a completely different direction, which is much better than the one that you had in the first. Mm -hmm. um, did you have to uh, do an annotated script with this film? Um, have you ever had to do one of those before? Um, no, I, I, I'm not sure I know what that is. It's, what is that? We we get asked sometimes in the library when somebody's writing, um, you know, something that's based on true events. I think, I, for, you know, for like legal purposes, it's kind of like a. Oh, where did paper. you get this information? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I've done that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, on on this, um, no, because it was all from people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, tell me something in this film um, that came directly from something you found in your research. Uh, many things. I mean, the weighing machine. Oh, wow. Is, <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't, who would invent that? You know, and, and here's someone with, a, with her condition. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you have to do is be weighed. And then you have to gain at least three pounds to prove it. I mean, it's all a joke. And it was set up in 1847 by um, uh, Prince Albert. And, but, you know, it, and the fact that it's a joke makes it even worse, really. But yeah, I mean, this, it was things, and things like the note and um, the fact that her house, boarded up house was just across the barbed wire. You know, there was a series of gifts for a writer in this, really, that, mm -hmm. um, that made it quite, uh, Fortuitous. Was the um was the scarecrow something that you came up with or something that you um no I that that's an invention. Um okay. the father's jacket isn't, but the scarecrow is. Got it. Um so um as somebody who you know started as a novelist, um, can you talk about learning to write roles that are kind of meaty and playable for actors? Um, spe specifically with this film? Um, yeah, I mean, I think you make your life easier as a writer if you've got characters who um, really rub up against each other quite badly, you know. Um, so it's, it's quite good to... I don't really base characters on people I've ever met, but... I think take it from situations where there's been extreme emotion and take that sort of, who, who somebody becomes in that situation is usually not a bad character to base something on. Um, and I, I, the character for me comes from writing the dialogue. Sometimes uh, at the very beginning, when you write a piece of dialogue, you get who that person is from something they've said, if you like. Because at the beginning, you're so free. And that's the great thing about starting something. You're absolutely at liberty to do anything. And, and your options get smaller and smaller and smaller, which is why endings are so difficult. In the end, you're in a corner, you know, and it's just like, I've only got this left. Uh, but I love the beginning because you can just do anything and say yeah. anything. And then the character can... Um, and if you're lucky enough to get great actors, it can make your characters look much more compelling than maybe they were on the play. Um, so who, speaking of characters, um, I guess other than Diana, who uh, who is the most difficult to get right on the page? Uh, good question. Um, <clears throat> Ivan Locke was difficult. Um, Holly in Peaky was difficult at first, um, but then became it, then she just wrote her her own stuff. You know, she <laughs> Holly became. It was just there. Uh, I mean, they're all difficult in their own way, I suppose. Um, but if you've got a, a historical character like Diana, at least you've got a peg to hang something on to begin with. Um, but if, it, if it's a complete um, invention, then I don't know where you go to get that person. You, I think it's like arguments and, and great days and extreme experiences that give you the character because... You, you can't, I suppose if you're writing fiction, you have to assume that you can't write the character as the person they are when they're on the bus or when they're going to get a coffee because no one cares. They've got to be the person they are when 
somebody knocks the coffee out of their hand. You know what I mean? It's got to be, mm-hmm. the character has to be as if there is conflict somehow. Sure. Um, so I, I want to go in uh, the opposite direction with my follow-up question. Who, uh, in, your, in your career, who's been the most fun to write? Tommy Shelby, Alfie Solomons. Um, we're good fun. Um, <laughs> Okwe in um, Dirty Pretty Things. Mm-hmm. Um, and funnily enough, Eastern Promises. Uh, I mean, Vigo's so great, but writing that character was good fun. Um, and I had this question earlier, I, I skipped over it, but um, w- so when you're, when you're writing characters um, and say you're writing Princess Diana, like, do you, do you have to do something to make the character um, identifiable or relatable to yourself in order to, in order to write her? And does research play a part in that? It, it does a bit. I, I do depend heavily on dialogue, establishing who the person is and experimenting with that. And I think it's a, it, it feels almost like a trick. It feels almost as if you're cheating because you're getting the character from some stuff that at first can be completely completely out of your imagination, just a jumble of stuff. And I'm, I'm a big believer if there's a bit of chaos, at the you can always get rid of it. You know, you can always go back and take it out. But if there's chaos at the beginning, they may, when you're writing it, they may say one thing that gives you who they are. And what it, I think what it is, is you write the piece of dialogue and you recognise that as something that somebody would have said that you could sort of, you've known that person or you've come across that. So I'm very dependent on writing dialogue in a very free way and then looking back at it and finding within it, sort of going through it and finding within it the bit that says, oh, that's who that person is, you know. That's how they swear or that that's how they don't swear or this is how they, you know, this is the word they use instead of that word. And I think you can really, you can get some good stuff from that because, I always think if you start with the characters, you, you, you know, you've done your outline of the characters, then off they go. You wind them off, wind them up and off they go. And, you know, I'm sure brilliant, brilliant stuff has been done that way. For me, I, I, can't, I personally can't do it like that. I have to sort of let it go first and then find out who they are subsequently, quite quickly, but within... The first few pages but you've got to find out who they are from what they say I think it's like meeting someone you know it's like meeting someone right. in, a, in a bar or something. You, you talk to them and oh that's who you are I just got it you know after 10 minutes they said something and go ah right. um okay so I've got three more questions including a follow-up to what you just said um so we know that uh that you don't outline but um, when you're doing research, um, do you keep keep track of you know what you're finding somehow and keep tabs on it? Oh yeah, I mean hand uh, handwritten notes in a notebook is is what I do. So you know I would do read whatever I'm going to read. This is particularly if it's if it's a true story set at a certain time, you've got to find out what happened. Mm-hmm. And if everyone's dead, then you only find out. I mean I, I just did a thing about. Special Forces SAS in North Africa. And there was one person left alive and he was 99. And I I swear I got more from him than I did from everything else. It just in like a two hour interview with his 99 year old ex-soldier. But if you can't do that, then of course you've got to go to all the different things. And I, I try, as I said, like New York ice cream, try to find the bits that don't fit in with what you would expect. So when you're talking to a 99 year old and asking mm-hmm. questions and stuff do you record that or is it just you with your notebook trying to notebook yeah somebody yeah. did record that one but I, I use a notebook because I think the notebook means that you just get the, the big tips you know the the, the top bits um and so and I, I mean you especially in a situation like you remember most of it. yeah yeah um okay um, so, so do you have any parameters 
personally for for what you think makes good historical drama um yeah that, that's my question <laughs> yeah I, I think everything comes down to the central character i think because um you know first i mean the story can be great but if it's if it's um uh, you know, if it's a conflict between two men who are pretty similar and they fight and then one of them wins, then there's probably nothing more in that than soldiers, you know. Whereas if it's, uh, if the whole thing came about as the result of the madness of one character or the brilliance of one character or the mistake made by one character, then you're really into the, because I absolutely believe that, um, no matter how many cars are being blown up and how many bombs are going off, the audience are looking at the eyes of the central character. That's where they're getting the information from. That's where they know what's going on because they're looking at the reaction and the emotion of the central character. And I think if you've got a central character who takes you on an interesting journey, then you stand a chance. Tiny follow-up. Um, is there any advice that you would give to somebody embarking um, on writing about true events. But yeah, I mean, in whatever research you do, try and find the oddest thing. Try and go and find the thing that wouldn't fit in, the thing you wouldn't expect. Because if, if you if you write out what the story as is written and as is known, if you're then you've not done anything different. Whereas if you find the oddness of the character or the you know. Um, I'll give you an example. I did, uh, again, the SAS thing. I was trying to find the character of the, the lead character, who was a, a real person called David Sterling, who set up the first Special Forces Army in the world in North Africa in 1941. And so you'd expect him to be this big, tough soldier, and he wasn't anything like that. Um, so I found out all these things, and I met his secretary, who'd been his secretary for about 40 years. And I said, what was he like? And she's telling me all the normal things. She said, oh, one thing, she said, and this was when he was 60 years old, so long after the war has ended. She said, um, when he used to, and they were working in, in government in Whitehall in London, she said, when he used to go out for a cigar at lunchtime, he'd get to the busy main road, close his eyes and cross the road. And it's like, <laughs> what? You know, and we'd had long conversation before this about normal things. And that one observation tells you everything this man in his 60s still needed the adrenaline of not knowing if he was going to survive crossing the road so he closed his eyes and that's what i mean is that after that i got him completely you know he that was him he, he, he closed his eyes to cross the road that's all you need to know and after that you're on you know you can go wow um well, that's that's some um, perfect sentiment <laughs> to sort of end on here. <laughs> um, but thank you so so much. This has been such a good conversation. I, I now I know to you know start far from home and go no, uh, from home. Go with yeah, the yeah. odd. And um, you know what? Before we totally totally adjourn, um, this is totally unrelated to anything but do you have like any one fun anecdote about um creating who wants to be a millionaire because when i found that out about you i was like <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, i don't know how fun it is but um we we came up with the idea and we kept playing it with people with money not the amount of money we ended up with but just you know substance 50 pounds or i don't know 100 dollars or and we kept finding that everybody would, would stop and take the money they'd won. They wouldn't carry on hmm. going with it. Um, and so we invented phone a friend to sort of try and keep them interested. 50-50 um, and you know, these things to try and say, you, you've got to keep on going because otherwise it just dies. And then we discovered that the way to keep somebody playing is to show them the next question before they make the decision, which is so simple. I mean, it's just, yeah. and it took us yeah. And then as soon as we did that, they look at the question and they go, oh, I might know that. And then they're in a dilemma. So that's, that's great. But it was, it was, a, it was a, an amazing, um, an amazing, I, I, I was, 
I knew it was successful when I was with my sons. We went into TGI Fridays in London. And then they used to have that day's USA Today front page in the men's toilet above the thing. <laughs> right. My sons. And the headline was, um, uh, who wants to be a millionaire saves the mouse, which meant Disney. Because wow. they, were, they were in trouble. I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> this is good. <laughs> So good. All right. Well, thank you again. This has been so great. And I um, hope everyone continues to enjoy WG Festival. And um, good luck with your writing, everyone. And thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Stephen. Brilliant. Um, Thanks a lot. <laughs>